Thank you. <laughs> yeah. You're very kind. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Andrew Platt. I'm with Racial Licious. Um, and one of the questions... You guys are a great site. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, one of the questions that several of our readers have brought up is your use of the word nigger. Mm. Um, and people are, of course, in their feelings about it. And I was wondering how you'd like to respond to that, especially using it in mixed race company. I guess it depends what's the, I guess it depends what's the, I guess it really depends what's the question. The question is, some people, well, it's more like of a complaint. Some people feel that um, you shouldn't be able to use that. Um, you shouldn't use that in mixed race company. You shouldn't use that in your book. So I guess the question becomes, why did you use it in Oscar Wilde, for example? Um, when you, why do you refer to it in your reading? When you could pick another such word, doesn't refer to that word at all. Does that make any sense? So, is it that the representation of that reality is problematic? It's, I think there's some people who just feel like, I don't understand why he needs to use the word at all. So, because... Because. Yeah, I guess I don't get the question. I mean, I guess, like, I guess, yeah. I'm not sure. I, I'm trying to get the question. Is it that certain people, in other words, I guess the thing is that, like, for example, I represent child rape in my books. Mm -hmm. So, is the problem is that some aspects of our reality should never be represented? So that the fact that, um, I mean, the way I grew up, certainly when I immigrated to the United States, I was called three kinds of nigger growing up. So what would be my artistic relationship to a reality? Um, the same thing, that there was an enormous amount of uh, sexual assault, sexual abuse, incest, and rape um, in the community that I grew up. And so the questions for me is always that, well, what are we, what is the resistance that folks have about representation? Because for me, the question is, is the argument that this shouldn't be represented? And so therefore, for example, um, certain folks are not permitted to represent, well, well, what? I mean, having being, you know, spent my entire US childhood being called various forms of nigger, mm -hmm. the right. thing would be, well, does that mean somehow because my sort of African descentness is not phenotypically recognizable enough? Is that the problem? So there seems to be a passport issue here where the certain folks are permitted because their passports um, at a phenotypical level register something and other folks are questioned because there's something about their phenotype that doesn't register something and I guess that this goes back to that old problem that we have, which is, uh, by we, I mean the communities of color that I'm familiar with, which are not all the communities of color even by the stretch, but this problem of authenticity, mm -hmm. um, where as a community, we're constantly pulling passports checks on each other. And for a Dominican who grew up partially in the Dominican Republic and partially in the United States, um, there's something very deeply problematic about that because in the Dominican Republic uh, there was a genocide against the Haitian community and the Haitian Dominican community that was predicated on this similar reflex of that certain folks have more humanity than other folks and depending on the way we sort of spin the humanity. In this case, we're spinning the humanity of certain level of blackness. Yep. In the Trujillato, it was the same thing. It was the same exact formula. The Trujillato used that formula to exterminate. In this case, we're using the formula to say, well, if you pass, you'll be good enough. But again, these economies share a very similar tendency, which is something that's called ergo conquiro, which is this uh, sort of this ideal of subjectivity at the heart of what we call modernity, which creates a suspicion around people of colors of full humanity. 
So ergo con quiero, we see playing itself out in Obama, the way that every single person was like in this sort of right-wing madness, kept questioning him and saying, well, give us your passport, give us your birth certificate, because there was a belief that a black dude couldn't really be fully human. And by fully human, of course, in this case, the shorthand was an American citizen. But there's constant suspicion. So I guess I, I, I don't know what's the, the beef you know, because also, and I mean, not to go on, also there's my sense of it that the N-word is certainly when I came up, remember I came up before social networks. Um, hip hop basically evolved with my childhood. I mean, you know, Rapper's Delight, which was for most of us who didn't live in the Bronx or Brooklyn, was the album which began this idea of sort of hip hop practices and made it really aware, made us aware. We were 11 when this shit came out. And so what was so interesting is growing up in this period um, that the ideas about blackness and ideas of, for example, who and what and how the N word was gonna be used was actually local culture. And that there were local ecologies about this and that, you know, the, what's interesting is that there's some rules in some local ecologies and they don't necessarily transfer to other local ecologies. Yeah, so that some group of people could be using this word, but if you pull them out and send them out of nowhere folk, it doesn't fly. Because these local cultures don't necessarily communicate with each other or have the same standards. And so I guess the way I was thinking about it, I was just trying to describe sort of the local ecology of the N-word in a place like central New Jersey, which was a very mixed African-American, Puerto Rican, Dominican, Caribbean community where the word was generalized among all the kids who grew up in these neighborhoods that I grew up in. And so again, the idea would be because there's a desire for an imperial blackness, for a blackness where one person has the keys to what blackness means, there's an idea that the local usage of the N-word in a place like Central Jersey is illegitimate and therefore should defer to the imperial blackness of, say, Brooklyn, or defer to the imperial blackness of, say, Baltimore. But try to convince kids on the ground of that. And so my thing is, it's less, again, I, I, I would argue that the use of the N-word in my books is no different from the use of the representation of child rape. It's an attempt to underscore the sort of complex, uh, you know, realities, but also ideas about comparative racializations and ideas about, you know, the way kind of what we would call colonial subjectivities are rendered in these kinds of spaces. I mean, but I don't know, I guess it's, I kind of wig out because I don't get the, I never get the issue. Because I wish those people had been there to, you know, to have been like, oh, <laughs> he's not a legitimate nigger, so don't call him that. Right. <laughs> when I was being victimized by that, but it's, you know, it is what it is. Well, I mean, I'm no expert. I mean, this is from just a citizen, yeah? Um, somebody who is an artist um, and kind of reflects on this, but I'm, I'm not any more qualified than the average person in some ways. I mean, I think if it's emblematic of anything, it's sort of a sclerotic Republican Party that is so addicted to its own rabid delusions that it can't explain reality in a way that would make sense to somebody outside of their party dogma. Um, I mean, this is just kind of the nonsense that you, th you think that you would see in a fantasy land. Um, but again, I guess Romney has to get around to explaining how they blew the race and how those billions of dollars went out the window. 
and I guess the way that he's thinking of doing it is by doubling down on the sort of predisposition that the folks were giving the money and that the organizations that bankrolled him have towards, uh, you know, viewing people of color as parasites, viewing youths as parasites, viewing women as parasites, you know, this kind of reversal of, uh, of what really is at stake, you know, what's really going on. Because, I mean, if we ask ourselves, if I got one of my students from MIT to come in and register, how much does Romney take out of the system versus how much does, you know, some woman in Area 4 in Cambridge, the only parasite in that formula would be someone like Romney. You know, so there's this discursive reversal as an attempt to obscure a social reality. The social reality is that the parasites, you know, and the people who are really mooching are the ones who are accusing everyone else of mooching. Did it really get very overt? I guess it depends on what your POV. I mean, from my perspective, it was always business as usual. You know what I mean? It was just happened to play on a larger stage. And so for some people who were not accustomed, perhaps, to seeing some of these white supremacist regimes in operation, um, but you know, it may have been startling, but I think that it was just pretty much business as usual. Um, I mean, I guess I don't know about how things are going to play out because, again, we're talking about very short-term periods. I think we have to take a look at longitudinal approaches, sort of. I mean, I like the sort of plurality that was revealed during this last election. Um, but again, physical majorities has never been, you know, themselves uh, proof against the kind of nonsense that we're seeing today. It's just like, just because people have the numbers doesn't mean that they're not going to be captured and controlled by minority elites. I mean, shit, it works well in Latin America. It works super well in Latin America, so I guess I don't know. I guess the idea of that, I mean, again, I just feel that the struggle continues and I certainly don't think that the opposing forces, the people who oppose the kind of Romney madness, the kind of, you know, the kind of sheltering of white supremacy that the Republican Party tends to exercise, I don't think that opposition has been activated. It has been activated. We have time for two or three quick questions, probably. Um, Jamila? Um, Jamila, seeing I work at Coyle Lines. Oh, what's going on? <laughs> Um, so I know you were instrumental in founding programs like Vona. Um, I wanted to know how you've been able to leverage the success that you've had to create opportunities for more writers of color. You mean beyond that? Huh? Beyond that? <laughs> beyond, well, including that, even. Right. Yeah, I mean, listen, it's, you know, I think the, the point of it is always is that you just keep doing as much of the work as humanly possible. Um, I mean, I'm interested in it. I'm like many of kids in my group, my kind of cohort, we just came up as young activists, young community organizers. That's kind of our background. I mean, privilege is privilege. We all have an enormous amount of it. Certainly, some of us have more than others. And the idea is like, you know, you try to use your privilege for what we would call, you know, the good work. For me, it's attempting to sort of not only encourage writers. I'm not only interested in writers. I mean, that's sort of trying to encourage young artists of color, trying to encourage um, students who are otherwise sort of um, marginalized to, uh, you know, to go to college, to participate, to support, you know, all sorts of programs that 
kind of make up the gap between some of our public schools and some of the more local private schools. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of crap you do. And a lot of it is programmatic, like Vona. A lot of it is, um, you know, is just you sort of doing stuff. Um, and you try to do as much as possible. I mean, I think, for example, take the Boston Review. I'm the editor of the Boston Review. We've published more first-time writers of color in the pages of the Boston Review than almost any place in, you know, that can be found. And so there's a subtle way that one can do that kind of work. Um, you know, me and my little group have given out, uh, you know, a whole series of scholarships, whether it's students of color trying to go to uh, art programs in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America. You know, you find ways to take care of this stuff. Raising money for Obama, raising money for Deval Patrick, um, trying to kind of do the kind of work against privatization of the schools uh, that was happening in New York City and continues to happen. You know, you try your best. Um, yeah. yeah. I am Scott Gaffer, I'm a board on the street, Baltimore's homeless and poverty street newspaper. Um, and I wanted to ask, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the, our city and our uh, history, but um, what perhaps do you see as uh, the promise of, of agreeing to deliver uh, an address at this particular conference in this particular city? You seem to you know, clearly appreciate what the conference itself means, and so could you at least comment on what you think the importance of having uh, a race-based conference in the city of Baltimore, especially given our history, um, all the way back to the Civil War and before, but as a concentrated racialized poverty, poverty in the population, uh, having this conversation in this city does mean something. And perhaps you could speak to what you see as uh, the promise of this conference and why you accepted the invitation. No, I, I think that there's no, uh, and there's no question that sort of what sort of the, you know, the way that the, our national silence around, uh, national silence and national obfuscation around uh, issues of race, around issues of white supremacy, that that silence echoes uh, profoundly in a place like Baltimore. You know, I mean, nowhere are the sort of evasions and silences of you know, these cultures made more visible than in places that are most, in some ways, victimized by them, or that have like a kind of a clear sort of historical relationship. Um, again, you know, a part of you, a part of me always thinks that the work is so, you know, part of the work that we're all doing, or I think we're doing, you know, is, has a lot to do with multiple strategies. You're trying a whole bunch of stuff. You're trying to keep your hands in a whole bunch of things. You never know what in the world is going to work. You never know how you're going to move somebody. It's sort of like being an artist. Um, in many ways, doing this presentation, doing this keynote, is sort of like writing a story or writing a book. You have no idea how this is going to end up. You have no idea that this piece of art that you're sending out into the world will have any effect on anyone. But there is a possibility, because you yourself have been transformed by art, as one has been transformed by activism, there is a possibility that maybe this could do something. And so I think most of these things tend to be what we would jokingly call faith-based initiatives. <laughs> you know? I mean, what else is possible, whether it's art or activism, that you operate in the good faith, that there's a possibility for transformation, and therefore it's a worthy strategy to pursue? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to say numbers don't mean anything. I just said historically, there's been a better way of saying it. Historically, there's been very efficient ways to neutralize numerical advantages, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, that's really a good question. I think part of what we, I've always thought, needs to happen across communities of color needs to be for us to have possessive investments in each other's identities and struggles. 
which is a way of saying that, um, you know, when you think of someone like, you know, you think of someone like Frank Chin, Frank Chin, who becomes involved in the Day of Remembrance for Japanese internment um, victims, who in fact becomes a person, of, of a very important person in this movement in the Day of Remembrance. And he's a Chinese American, and yet he felt uh, very much a possessive investment in sort of uh, the identity of Japanese folks. Now one could say, well, no, this is Asian Americans. Well, guys, it doesn't always slice that way, the way communities work. And I think that there's often, I mean, we saw with the first question, there's also, there's almost often a possessive investment in what we call our identities. That we can barely, we want to, we think of these things as commodities, and therefore we hold them as if we're holding money. Therefore, for example, the white supremacist way that it uses the N-word suddenly turns into a local treasure that we have to keep other people from. And that we, that somehow it becomes this thing that we keep our arms around. And that we can't imagine it as a source of connection. Instead it becomes a source of exclusion. The way that our identities are currently constructed, they are constructed not as points of contacts, but as exclusionary, proprietary um, sort of complexes. And I think that we need to think of them as our our differences and our similarities always as launch, as launch pads for contact, yeah? I mean, and so that if somebody has, for example, if the N-word is common throughout certain groups, yes, I think it's important for us to have a full-out conversation of what that might mean, but at the same time, use it as a point of connection, as a point to sort of connect, to build on it. But this proprietary relationship to our kind of ethnic identities, I think, is going to haunt us if we don't begin to shift it, if we can't imagine a world where a white Argentinian can come to Cuba and participate fully in their revolution. Could you imagine somebody permitting that now? We don't, we, we, I think it's very difficult. I think it's very difficult to imagine something like uh, Jose Marti, who Jose Marti, comes from New Jersey, goes to Miami, goes to Tibor City, goes to St. Thomas, and this is with troops. Troops from Miami, goes to St. Thomas, picks up troops and money, then goes to um, the Dominican Republic, picks up troops and money, then goes to Haiti, picks up troops and money, then goes to Jamaica, picks up troops and money, and finishes the attempt to uh, you know, liberate Cuba, where he, of course, dies. But could you imagine us allowing or thinking our, our national complexes being that open? Being like, oh, here's uh, 10,000 Cubans in Jamaica. We feel like you're such a part of us that we're going to welcome you. I feel like our identities have become so much more miserly and so much more closed. And I think that we've got to figure out, both at a national level and within our own communities in a place like the United States, how we can open these things up. Just the last question to follow up on that, Alicia Stewart, CNN. Can you um, talk about why you think that it is why they have become more close or more miserly in your words? Um, identities specific to whether they're transnational or even just cross-cultural within the U.S.? I mean, I don't know if I'm the expert about it, but I mean, I certainly I think that the fact that everything in our lives in the last 30 years has been increasingly commodified. Mm -hmm. And that the commodifications of national and local identities um, is, I think, something that we haven't really been strategizing around. So therefore, I think that people who don't got shit feel that there is a little lump of treasure called my identity. And instead of thinking that this is a passport into connecting with other people who don't got shit, we think of it as like, I've got to keep this from other people. I've got to keep other people from claiming this space. You know, the same way, guys, listen, the same way I heard the Republican Party's constant suspicion of Obama as an American, I hear various groups, especially among, you know, organizers, questioning each other's credentials. Yep. Non-stop. And the flow, it, it's incredible how it, it's the same exact grammar. It's this thing, ergo concuro, this idea that even if we think of ourselves as human beings in our group, we rarely extend that shared humanity 
to another group. So I'll say I'm African American, I'll be like, okay, I, I think of myself as fully human, but Asian Americans, I'm not so sure they're really down. Right. Mm. Latinos, I'm not so sure they're really down. Which is a different way of saying, if we follow the logic, I'm not so sure they're really human and are worthy of my love and worthy of sharing this treasure called our identity.